Coming up, voodoo dolls, curses, goddesses, shamans. Hi, I'm Juliet, and welcome to a brand new series on my channel, A History of Witchcraft and Magic in Europe. This is part one, Ancient Greece. So the first thing we need to understand about magic in the ancient world is that its relationship with religion is not the same as in the later Christian world. In later Christian thought, magic became associated with evil, with the devil, with Satan, with the opposite of God. In the ancient world, that's not quite the case. There were times when magic was thought of in opposition to religion, particularly in the Roman world. It's not religio, which is proper religion, but we're in the ancient Greek world today. And magic is not held in complete opposition to religion in the same way that it would be later on. In fact, in ancient Greece, there is actually a goddess of magic, the goddess Hecate. Hecate is the goddess of pathways and crossroads and of the moon, as well as ghosts, witchcraft and necromancy. So she is a busy goddess. She was associated in part with the Greek goddess Artemis. Artemis is the virgin goddess of the moon, the sister of Apollo. Apollo, of course, god of the sun. Hecate is often referred to as chthonic. This is an epithet meaning of the earth and it's associated with the gods and goddesses of the earth and the underworld. So gods like Hades, the god of the underworld, Persephone, his wife, and there are chthonic aspects of some of the other gods like Zeus, the chief god who's god of the sky, but who can have a chthonic underground aspect. Chthonic Dionysus, Dionysus is the god of wine and ecstasy and theater. And Hermes, Hermes is the messenger god, but it is his job to take souls to the underworld when they die. So he has a lot of associations with death and the underworld as well. So there's a chthonic aspect of Hermes. Persephone, of course, is the maiden who in Greek myth is abducted by Hades, the god of the underworld, dragged off to the underworld to be his queen. Her mother Demeter, the goddess of corn, spends ages looking for her and eventually there's an agreement made where she spends six months above the earth with her mother, which is spring and summer, because Demeter's the goddess of uh, agriculture and corn and the harvest. And then she spends six months in the underworld with her husband Hades, and that is autumn and winter, because Demeter is sad because she doesn't have her daughter with her. And Hecate, the goddess of witchcraft, was sometimes associated with Persephone and her abduction. So you can see here in this image a statue of Hecate. She is often depicted in this way with three heads. This statue is from the Vatican Museums. It's probably Roman period, but it shows the goddess in one of her frequent forms. Being goddess of the crossroads, of course, part of having three heads is about being able to look three different ways at once. We can see the association with Persephone and the gods of the underworld and Persephone's abduction in this vase. Uh, this is from the 4th century BCE. It shows Hades and Persephone seated in their palace. Outside on the left is Heracles' wife Megara with her two sons and a woman with a torch who is probably Hecate. She's often depicted carrying torches. Sometimes she's depicted looking like Artemis but carrying a torch instead of a bow. So what makes something witchcraft and magic in ancient Greece rather than prayer and religion? Well, this is the sort of topic that academics spend hours arguing about, and I have run entire hour-long seminars on this subject. But if I wanted to try to sum it up incredibly briefly, the core difference, other than if Hecate is involved, it's probably magic, is probably that a magic spell is designed to force the gods or another divinity or supernatural power to do something. A prayer is a request. And it's a very, very fine line because a lot of ancient Greek religion is highly ritualized and you'll kill an animal and you'll dedicate it to the god. You might sleep on its skin if you're at an incubation sanctuary, which is where you sleep and ask for a dream from the god or whatever else you're doing. But whatever you're doing will frequently be highly ritualized with set prayers and you are expecting a result from it. If you go to an incubation sanctuary and you do the ritual and you sleep on the skin of the animal in the sanctuary, you are expecting a dream from the god. So it is a very, very fine line between religion and magic. But we could just about draw the line at the point where it stops being a request and becomes a command. Even in those incubation sanctuaries, the way the god is addressed will still be a prayer. Please, can you do this? Can you send me a dream? Can you heal me? Whatever. The difference with a spell is that it's a command. There is an expectation that if you do a spell, that the result will happen. 
and with a prayer there's always the possibility that the god will choose not to answer the prayer. Magic in the ancient Greek world is especially associated with some forms of divination, particularly necromancy, the raising of the dead, although that's obviously primarily in kind of fiction and literature, uh, but some other methods of divination as well. And it's also associated with poisoning, and that's another area where it can be very difficult to separate what's witchcraft and magic and what's something else. We're obviously familiar with the idea of a witch's potion, and in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome, there the idea of poison was very closely connected with the idea of magic. So in some cases, a witch might make up a potion that we would read as a poison, that we would read as just you've mixed up some herbs that you know will kill somebody or harm them in some way. Um, we wouldn't see that as magic. But in the ancient world, it's very much included with magical practices. And this is something that, again, will come up even more in our next episode when we look at ancient Rome. We can see a bit more about how the ancient Greeks thought about magic from this section from Plato's Laws. This is a philosophical text which sets out kind of what the laws might be in the ideal city. So as the characters in the text are working out what the ideal laws should be, they have this conversation about poisoning. A division in our treatment of poisoning cases is required by the fact that, following the nature of mankind, they are of two distinct types. The type that we have now expressly mentioned is that in which injury is done to bodies by bodies according to nature's laws. Distinct from this is the type which, by means of sorceries and incantations and spells, as they are called, not only convinces those who attempt to cause injury that they really can do so, but convinces also their victims that they certainly are being injured by those who possess the power of bewitchment. We see this quite often in some ancient discussions of magic, an awareness of the placebo effect, and an implication that what makes it magic or witchcraft is the fact that somebody is kind of convincing you <laughs> that this thing is going to be effective and then people become convinced that it's effective because they believe the person who's convinced them. And you could take this all the way up to Terry Pratchett's Discworld and Granny Weatherwax's headology if you want to take it really far. Plato continues, In respect of all such matters, it is neither easy to perceive what is the real truth, nor, if one does perceive it, is it easy to convince others. And it is futile to approach the souls of men who view one another with dark suspicion if they happen to see images of moulded wax at doorways or at points where three ways meet, or it may be at the tomb of some ancestor, to bid them make light of all such portents when we ourselves hold no clear opinion concerning them. Consequently, we shall divide the law about poisoning under two heads, according to the modes in which the attempt is made. If it be held that a man is acting like an injurer by the use of spells, incantations, or any such mode of poisoning, if he be a prophet or diviner, he should be put to death. But if he be ignorant of the prophetic art, he shall be dealt with in the same way as a layman convicted of poisoning. So we can see throughout this text the connection between magic and poisoning and prophecy. <laughs> Now, of course, there are some very famous witches in Greek myth, and one of the most famous is Circe. Circe appears in Homer's Odyssey. This is the story of the Greek hero Odysseus's return from Troy. It takes him 10 years. He keeps running into trouble. We talked about him in the video about mermaids when we talked about sirens. And he is held captive by nymph called Calypso for seven years. He also spends one year being held by Circe, who is a semi-divine witch. So she has this divine aspect to her. She is descended from the gods, but she is also a witch. And in many Greek vases, she's actually depicted with a magic wand, literally just a kind of traditional stick-like what we would picture as a magic wand. In Homer's Odyssey, she turns Odysseus's men into pigs, and you can see that happening on this vase here. Uh, you can see Circe is the woman kind of running away towards the right, and you can see a man with the head of a pig and the body of a man. This is because on a still two-dimensional image, you can't show movement, you can't show somebody turning from a human into an animal. So whenever Greek artists are trying to depict that, they'll usually do half and half. So they'll do something like this, where you've got the head of the pig and the body of a man, which is meant to show that the man is turning into a pig. It doesn't mean he's running around with a pig's head for a prolonged period of time. It means he's in the middle of changing form. And we can see here, I think this is Odysseus chasing after Circe with a sword. Circe ends up being quite helpful once she has been defeated and overpowered by Odysseus. And she gives him quite a lot of help and advice for his onward journey in the end. But she's clearly quite a dangerous force. Probably the most famous witch of all from Greek myth is Medea. 
Medea is most famous for getting back at her husband for running off with a younger woman by killing her own children. This is to do with the fact that children go with the father in Greek culture and they are considered to belong to their father more than to their mother. It was also a slightly later addition to the myth. Early versions do not have Medea kill the children deliberately. They get killed by accident or they get killed by Corinthians or various other things. But it was the playwright Euripides in the 5th century BCE who introduced this idea that Medea deliberately murders them to get back at her husband Jason. And since then, that tends to be the version that everybody has gone with. And she is most well known for her appearances in Euripides' play Medea and in Apollonius Rhodius' epic poem Argonautica, which is a little bit later. But she does appear in all sorts of other texts and in lots and lots of images as well. In Medea, at one point, she declares, I shall follow my usual way, the way of which I most experienced, the way of poison! Yes, I shall poison them! Although, as we can see from this vase, she was often imagined as stabbing her poor children, but she is known as a poisoner. There's that association of witchcraft and poison again. At another part, she says, Aegeus, you have no idea what you've stumbled upon when you come across me. I promise you I'll make it possible for you to have children. I know the drugs that would bring this about. So there's an association there of her witchcraft with drugs in general, and also with fertility and with childbearing. One of the things that sometimes happens throughout history is the association of um, midwifery, but more particularly uh, giving people drugs either to induce an abortion as a contraceptive or to try and improve fertility, whichever way around it is. Um, but the association of using drugs to do any of those things sometimes gets associated with witchcraft. Elsewhere in Greek mythology, Medea puts a dragon to sleep with special herbs. She hypnotizes a giant bronze man called Talos. She restores Ison's youth by drawing blood from him, infusing it with herbs and putting it back in him. In one story, the daughters of King Pelias then ask her to do the same for their father. She shows them how by cutting up a ram, putting it in a cauldron with some herbs, and then it springs out young and healthy, as we see in this image. Uh, but when the daughters of Pelias try it on their dad, uh, because Medea does not like Pelias and has not told them how to do it properly, it does not work. She also helps Jason escape her own father by murdering her own young brother and in some versions chopping him up into bits and throwing him in the sea. So she's associated with a few things, with poison, with the cauldron. So we've already seen a magic wand and a witch's cauldron appear as long ago as ancient Greek myth. Those are very, very old tropes. She's associated with herbs. And she's associated with extreme violence, um, chopping people up and putting them in cauldrons or in the sea. There's even a vampiric element to the drawing of blood and then putting it back in him again to restore his youth. We meet another fictional witch in a poem called Idyll II by Theocritus from the Hellenistic period. This is around the third, second century BCE. The witch in this poem is called Simetha. And she may be a little bit more like real witches. So Circe was half divine and Medea is descended from gods and goddesses as well. So they both have an aspect of divinity in themselves already. Their witchcraft comes from their divine heritage. In the case of Simetha, who appears to be a young woman performing this spell against her lover or her this person who has spurned her, she does not appear to fit that mould. Simetha is a human being, she doesn't have divine heritage of any kind. She is working these spells and working this magic to get what she wants. Simetha first burns barley meal, bay leaves, a wax puppet and some bran. Then she hears dogs barking and drums indicating the goddess coming. This seems to be the goddess Artemis, who's of course associated with Hecate. She makes libations, that's liquid offerings, and she prays. Then she burns a herb and a piece of her lover's cloak. And throughout the whole thing, she's turning a magic four-spoked wheel. Here are a few lines from the poem. As I melt this wax doll with the help of the goddess, so may Delphus of Mindos, this is the lover, at once be melted by love. And as by the power of Aphrodite, this bronze bull roarer, a rhombus whirls around, so may he whirl round at my door. We can see several themes that we've seen already. Doors, crossroads, liminal spaces. Liminal means a space in between things. So a beach, for example, is a liminal space between the land and the sea. Doorways and crossroads are liminal spaces, neither one thing nor the other. And witchcraft and magic is very much associated with them. We also heard her mention the wax doll. Did you know that the ancient Greeks had voodoo dolls? Now, we want to put inverted commas really around the word voodoo. <laughs> this has nothing to do with Haitian voodoo. Um, the name is used as a label. 
because by the time archaeologists and scholars discovered the Greek version, they already knew about the Caribbean version. And the, the thing is pretty similar. It's a very similar concept. So it seemed easiest to just call them voodoo dolls. And then we all know what we're talking about. It doesn't actually have anything to do with, with voodoo. It's entirely separate from that religion. Sometimes they're known as colossoi instead. Although that's a bit confusing because colossus in Latin means huge. Uh, this is in fact a Greek word, not a Latin word. And they're very small. These are usually made of lead, bronze, clay or wax. And as we know from the poem, the wax ones could potentially be activated by melting. And of course, that means we don't have the wax ones. We mostly know them from things like the poem. Most wax ones haven't survived because they were melted as part of the ritual or spell. The ones that we have are the ones that are made of lead or, or sometimes bronze or clay. These dolls are often bound, sometimes with the head or limbs twisted. This is probably an attempt to physically confuse the victim. So they often have bound hands, bound feet, and head twisted around. And the idea is that this will not physically twist around the head of the victim, not literally physically make their head turn like the exorcist or something, but it will make their head spin in a, a figurative metaphorical way. <laughs> um, they won't be able to see straight, they won't know what they're doing in a, a brain foggy kind of way. It's similar to ancient Greek binding spells, which aim to bind somebody, again, figuratively. They'll sometimes have a little drawing, you'll see on um, lead curse tablets, um, a little drawing of a little figure, and there'll be lines scratched across it and it will say bind their tongue, bind their hands, bind their feet, bind whatever other body parts you want to bind because it wants them to not be able to speak properly or do things properly or walk properly and they'll kind of scratch images of rope binding them onto the little cartoon on the tablet sometimes. The voodoo dolls are often inscribed with the victim's name although they don't usually look like they resemble a specific person, it's hard to tell sometimes <laughs> uh, the state of preservation they're in. Sometimes they have more than one name. Their use in Greek context dates from at least the 4th century BCE and their use continued. Episode 2 is going to be ancient Rome. We're going to see more of these. The City of New York University in Brooklyn notes that one distinguishing characteristic of the Greek use of colossoi is that it is primarily defensive. It is generally aimed at containing a hostile force rather than destroying it. So some of them are quite aggressive. They want to attack the victim but a lot of the Greek ones are trying to protect themselves from attack. I mentioned curse tablets, which are often found with the voodoo dolls. You can find the dolls by themselves, you can find many curse tablets by themselves, you quite often find them together. We have found from ancient Greece and Rome uh, together more than 1600 curse tablets, mostly in Greek, not all, mostly inscribed on lead or lead alloy. They are usually rolled up, obviously they're made of lead, so it's a soft metal. So the, the lead is inscribed and then the tablet will be rolled up and sometimes pierced with nails. Sometimes they include hair or clothing, especially if it's a love spell. Uh, love, I use that word very loosely, an erotic spell. I don't think that's any better. You know what I mean. <laughs> Uh, particularly from the 4th century BC onwards. We have more Roman period ones than Greek, but they do go all the way back to the classical period of ancient Greece. Classical period of ancient Greece, by the way, is roughly the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, um, before the Common Era, or BC before Christ. So these go back at least as far as the early 5th century BCE. Uh, they've been found in a Greek colony in Sicily. Uh, we found 22 tablets there. One of the earliest of these tablets that has been found was in a cemetery in this Greek colony in Sicily and it was about a legal issue. Most of the tablets that we found that predate the Roman Empire have been found in the cemetery in Athens, uh, the Keramikos, which is the ancient Athenian cemetery, and also in the Athenian Agora. The Agora in an ancient Greek city is basically the town square. And we found a few others scattered around other Greek city-states. Classical Athenian tablets, again, often relate to litigation. For example, this is what a lead curse tablet from Athens dating back to the early 4th century BCE says. This has been translated by Daniel Ogden in his book Magic, Witchcraft and Ghosts in the Greek and Roman Worlds, a source book. And it has two sides to it. Side A says, If anyone put a binding spell on me, be it man or woman, slave or free, alien or citizen, from my household or from outside it, be it out of envy toward my work or actions, if anyone put a binding spell on me before Hermes, be it Hermes Eriunios, giver of good fortune, or Hermes Restrainer, or Hermes Trickster, or before some other power. I bind in return all my enemies. 
Side B says, I bind my opponent in court Dion and Granikos. So this is both offensive and defensive. <laughs> Side B is on the offensive, trying to bind the opponents in court to win the court case. Side A is protecting the person against their enemies trying to bind them and putting a curse on them. Some of these curse tablets would call on either a ghost or a dead person or maybe a daimon. A daimon in ancient Greece is a being that is between gods and mortals. So not kind of as high as a god, but a supernatural being uh, who is more than a mortal. Although it is the root of the English word demon, they are not demons, they are not evil. Daimons are spirits. Uh, there is nothing specifically evil about an ancient Greek daimon at all, but they can be used for magic and witchcraft. So Ogden has also translated a lead tablet from either Megara or Arcadia, which is addressed to a character called Pasianax, who may be a ghost or may be a daimon. The name means Lord of All, so it's hard to tell which it is. Side A reads, Whenever you, O Pasianax, read this text, but neither will you, O Pasianax, ever read this text, nor will Neophanes ever bring a case against Agasibolos. But just as you, O Pasianax, lie here ineffectual, so too may Neophanes become ineffectual and nothing. That does make it sound like Pasianax is a dead person. Um, that might explain why so many curses are found in cemeteries as well. Side B reads, Whenever you, O Pasianax, read this text, but neither will you ever read this, nor will Acestor or Timandridas ever bring a case against Eratomenes. But just as you lie here ineffectual and nothing, so may Acestor and Timandridas be ineffectual and nothing. So it sounds like Pasianax is a dead person and that this tablet is maybe situated near where they are buried or even in their grave or something. Um, and that that's who is being addressed. But the fact that the name means Lord of All does make it a bit of a grey area, whether it's a ghost or a daimon. And of course, we do see curse tablets relating to human relationships. I would hesitate to call it love, um, but to relationships between people. This is called the Pella Curse Tablet. It is again lead, 4th century BCE, from Macedonia. It was discovered in 1986. You can see where it's been rolled if you look at this image. Um, you can see all the folds in it. That's because it was rolled up and the archaeologists have had to unroll it in order to read it. This tablet says, Of Thetima and Dionysophon, the ritual wedding and the marriage I bind by a written spell, as well as the marriage of all other women to him, both widows and maidens, but above all of Thetima. And I entrust this spell to Macron and to the Daimonaires. That's the plural of Daimon. And were I ever to unfold and read these words again after digging the tablet up, only then should Dionysophon marry, not before. May he indeed not take another woman than myself, but let me alone grow old by the side of Dionysophon and no one else. I implore you, have pity for, and then a little bit of a question mark. Some of these are hard to read, as you can tell from the image, possibly Fila. Dear Diamonaires, I am bereft of all my dear ones and abandoned, but please keep this piece of writing for my sake so that these events do not happen and wretched Thetima perishes miserably, but let me become happy and blessed. So I would hazard a guess that a Dionysophon uh, has married Thetima and that possibly Fila, whoever wrote this curse tablet, wanted him for herself. So she is clearly asking for something positive for herself and cursing Thetima at the same time. And these curse tablets and voodoo dolls continue well into the Roman period, so we will be returning to them. But finally, before we leave ancient Greece, there is another category of magical practice that is a little bit less uh, violent and uh, even more closely connected with religion. There is a category of Greek prophet uh, who is referred to by scholars as a shaman. Now, the word shaman specifically refers to a Tungus, that's Siberian medicine man, but it has been used by anthropologists for religious practitioners of any gender who use supernatural power and who usually use less ritualized and more individual practices than priests. So the word shaman, although it initially referred to quite a specific role in Tunguskan society, is now used by archaeologists and anthropologists for a particular type of religious slash magical practitioner in various different cultures. It usually has an emphasis on contact with the spirit world. And scholars of ancient Greece have referred to some male sorcerers from the archaic period as shamans. Now, you will have noticed that the witches in literature were mostly female. But in real life magical practice, we frequently see male magical practitioners. And sometimes in myth as well. So Orpheus, the mythological character who tries to get his wife back from the underworld, but looks when he was told not to and she is taken back and he fails, also associated with music, 
He's also associated with magic and magical practice. And there was a mystery cult, a cult that the secrets of the cult are only open to initiates, was formed around Orpheus. Also, a lot of followers of the philosopher Pythagoras ended up associating him with magic. Uh, Pythagoras, you probably know as the guy with the triangles. Uh, the Pythagorean theorem of triangles is mainly where most of us hear of him. But Pythagoras was the founder of a whole school of philosophy involving all sorts of things, a belief in the transmigration of souls, which is a bit like reincarnation. Uh, he thought you shouldn't eat beans. Um, yeah, uh, Pythagoras has, has a lot more to him than triangles, and he was also associated with magic. Um, he is not a mythological character, he's a real person, but he lived so long ago that he's got an almost legendary quality to him. Another philosopher who was sometimes associated with magical practice is Empedocles. So those are all male, male people, male characters, and they may be associated with these shamanistic practices. And these shamans seem to have been connected to descents into the underworld, figurative if they're real people, literal if you're Orpheus, uh, with divination, with attempts to control the weather, with dismissal of pollution and pestilence, and with Apollo. Apollo is the god of both medicine and plague, as well as the sun, as well as music, which Orpheus is also associated with, as well as prophecy. Apollo is an extremely busy god. Um, he clearly never had a day off. Ever. So those are somewhere between religion and magic and part of the reason that we associate them with magic has to do with how the Romans perceived Pythagoras and part of the reason we associate them with magic has to do with comparing them with other cultures and with other kind of prophets and medicine men and whatever who have been labelled shamans and women let's say it's not gender specific and shamans in some cultures are of a third gender or non-binary so you don't have to be male, but in the case of ancient Greece, generally speaking, the shamans are male, as opposed to the wicked poisoners of fiction who tend to be female. So I hope you enjoyed that whistle-stop tour through magic and witchcraft in ancient Greece. Many practices in ancient Greek magic overlapped and carried on into the Roman period, and part two of this series is going to focus on the ancient Roman world. So please do join us for that. I'm going to put up episodes in this new series about once a month. So subscribe to my channel and hit the bell for notifications if you want to be told when the next episode is up. I stole the title for this series from Bengt Ankalu and Stuart Clark's excellent book series. And I will show you a few copies. They're not very easy to get hold of these days. <laughs> I've struggled a little bit. This series is edited by Ankalu and Clark and... Uh, the authors of individual chapters, it's loads of different scholars focusing on different periods. Um, so this is uh, volume two, Ancient Greece and Rome. They actually started with Egypt. I've left Egypt off because it is not Europe, um, although we are going to briefly visit North Africa in the Roman episode. Uh, this is uh, the volume on the Middle Ages. Uh, this is their volume on the, the period of the witch trials. Um, so I've shamelessly stolen the title from them uh, and I would absolutely recommend their books. I've put a link uh, to um, where you can buy the volume on Greece and Rome from Amazon in the description. If this is a subject you're interested in, then absolutely they're hard to get hold of, but it is worth investing in those books. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and do please join me next time. There will be more and more elaborate voodoo dolls, more curses, more spells and a trial for witchcraft. So until then, bye!